everyone, and welcome to our afternoon workshop of two papers. Uh, my name is Sarah Byrne Martelli, and I'm a chaplain in Boston, and I'm also the OCAMPER secretary, and so happy to see you all. So today we have two papers. Uh, first, we have The Role of Mystery in COVID Care, presented by Father Joshua Ginnick, and The Paranoia of a Vaccinated Body of Christ, presented by Alex Justin Oldwin. And um, so each paper will be presented for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions and discussion. And if you have any particular questions, feel free to type them into the chat during the presentation. So thank you very much. And take it away, Father Joshua. Okay. Are you able to see the PowerPoint that I'm sharing right now? Yes. Although you Wonderful. Have okay. There you go. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Joel. Thanks uh, to everyone who is here to listen. Um, it's been a great conference so far from what I've been able to hear, although I'm still adjusting to the time difference. I'm on the East Coast and trying to think about um, the, the time out there and, and schedule things correctly. It's been, been a challenge, but uh, it's great to be here. My paper is entitled, as Sarah said, The Role of Mystery in COVID Care. Uh, just a very quick introduction to myself. I am a priest in the Russian Church in the Moscow Patriarchate in Michigan, serving in Redford at St. Innocent of Irkutsk Russian Orthodox Church. Um, I also uh, am a dean for this deanery here in the central states of the Russian Church. But my day job is I'm a chaplain at St. Joseph Mercy uh, Catholic Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan, part of Trinity Health. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to share this. Uh, this flows out of a, a paper that was written and submitted and published in the Journal of Religion and Health a number of months ago, but I think it's still apropos given everything we're, we're going through right now. So uh, to begin, I will admit that when I first encountered COVID in January, it was roughly January of 2020, I think like all of us, I had zero awareness that we would still be discussing this 22 months later. Uh, I can remember rounding on the units I covered, the surgical ICU, trauma, burn ICU, and everybody said, this is just a bad flu. It's going to be fine. Here we are 22 months later, devoting uh, not just this conference, but many others to it. And so I think we've all, we all would agree that our world has changed, and probably it's changed forever. Uh, Sarah mentioned right before we started going back to normal. And I, I don't know, at least in healthcare, if we're ever going to go back to what we knew as normal before. But I would suggest, I would offer that that might actually be a gift and a blessing for us to have the opportunity to re-examine old assumptions that we made uh, and also correct where necessary. And I think this paper, this short paper, is an attempt, a small attempt, uh, to do just that. Before I begin, though, let me make an assertion, and it may be a big assertion, but I think it's uh, it's one we ought to consider. The assertion is this. The modern world, the modern world, for all of its good, has failed us. The modern world, for all of its good, has failed us. Now, there is a lot to unpack, beginning with the very definition of what is the modern world. As one might expect, the specific definition of the modern period is as varying as those who dare to offer a timeline. What tends to be more congruent, however, are the key characteristics of this era, of this modern world. Things such as belief in progress and the move towards secularization. Things that were so prominent in the 18th century enlightenment. Also the scientific revolution of the 17th century, which as you all know, laid the groundwork for the singular place of honor that has been shown to rational investigation throughout the last 200 or 300 years. The fundamental premise of the modern world, from my perspective, was very simple. It promised us that science and technology could save us. It could save our patients, save our jobs, and even at times, save our souls. As the Princeton philosopher Diogenes Allen put it, he put a very fine point on it when he observed that, quote, modern science and technology so improved life that they led to a belief in progress and in time to a belief in inevitable progress, unquote. The question before us, at least as I begin, is, has the modern world kept its promise that with the advancement of science and technology, we could solve all of our troubles. We could solve our problems. We could move forward. We could get better. 
we could go from strength to strength. Indeed, there has been progress, but not all progress, as we know, is good progress. We are now able to hurt people and harm people and even kill people in ways we never knew before. Think about how much we know, but how much, with that knowledge, how much damage we can do to other people and even to ourselves. The point is that just because we are smarter does not mean that we are better, nor does it mean that our lives are fundamentally improved. However, and this is the shift I want to make in this paper as we begin to talk about mystery, a dramatic cultural shift took place in the rapidly changing early stages of the 21st century. And I would suggest that that cultural shift is still taking place today. This shift included a move away from the desire for revolution and rationality, desire that was so characteristic of the modern world, toward a more postmodern direction, encompassing all aspects of human life. What this means, of course, is that the modern or the medical students coming up through the ranks today are not like their modern teachers. The Pew Research Center identifies these postmoderns as those born between 1981 and 1996, those who were 24 to 39 years old in 2020 as COVID started. And what this indicates is that medical students and trainees today are firmly entrenched in this postmodern or what some call the millennial milieu. And for all the misconceptions about this generation, things like they only live in their parents' basement, (laughs) or uh, they're unable to think clearly, as this diagram shows here, for all the misconceptions, they are known by one dominant truth. They are given to that which is ancient, to that which came well before them and their immediate predecessors. This reality of a desire for something ancient, something much older, is clearly seen in the postmodern disdain for meta narratives. The French philosopher Jean Francois Lyotard, in his seminal work, The Postmodern Condition, described meta narratives as grand stories that attempt to prove or legitimate themselves, quote, by an appeal to universal reason. They prove themselves or legitimate themselves by by an appeal to universal reason, unquote. That was the modern way. Instead, postmoderns are drawn to narrative and myth, ways of telling stories that do not need legitimacy in order to have an impact or even to be true. All of life, in fact, becomes a story that is being told in real time. However, because it cannot be proven or legitimated, as the moderns would like it to be, this story is inherently mysterious. The natural pull of the postmodern's life is a life toward mystery and a way of living, being, and doing that probably looks far more like the first century and the early church than it does the 20th century. Very simply, postmoderns often view humanity itself as intrinsically and inherently mysterious. Postmoderns often view humanity as beyond comprehension. Given all the foregoing, though, modernism and then the dramatic shift in postmodernism, we, those of us who are in some version of, we're we're some version of medical clinicians or psychologists every day, we run into this, this difficulty. There is a challenge with every patient encounter, especially those I would suggest in a hospital setting. Because there we treat patients based upon their chemistry. We treat patients based upon their chemistry because that's what our modern education has taught us. But what is sometimes speaking loudest in these patients is their inherent mystery. And this can be seen so very clearly in the present COVID-19 pandemic. Today, and we know this, that's the reason we have this conference, today we are in uncharted territories. 
Hospitals are overwhelmed, if not with patients, at least with, with chaos and death. And those of you in hospitals have seen this image hundreds of times, fully gowned in PPE, sitting in the hallway, wondering, you know, what is happening? What kind of life is this? Frontline workers have not been able to catch their breath. As a nation and a medical community, we, mali- we believe that we must find a lasting solution to this problem. That modern science, and we've heard this, that modern science must meet this once-in-a-lifetime virus and defeat the enemy. The enemy is death, the death to which it so easily leads. Yet in this current cultural and medical and viral milieu, and with the pressure to prevent death at all costs, what we have been most successful at, sadly, is reducing patients to objects, especially in the absence of family and friends at bedside. Clinicians, too, end up functioning more like robots than like human beings. If you've been in an ICU during COVID, there are no family members. Most people are fully gowned in PPE, so you can't sometimes even recognize if they're a man or a woman. And patients themselves, as I often hear on my unit, are not even identified by their first name. They're identified as their room number, 663 or 712. Totally depersonalizing, totally dehumanizing. And clinicians also begin to function like robots. I just, a death happens. I just saw this this week. A death happens of a COVID patient. You come out, take off your PPE, you put on new stuff, you go across the hall, you go into another room, and you do the same thing all over again. But this should not surprise us. If modernism has done one thing for humanity's view of God, it was that it made God into an object, discernible only through the scientific method. And if humanity is made in God's image, then would not the same hold true for the humanity now suffering from this deadly virus and those who care for them? In turn, if modernism taught us that God was an object and we are made in God's image, then wouldn't our patients and even we ourselves become objects and not people, not humans? If this is true, then it seems that it has left all of us from doctors and nurses and techs and respiratory therapists and psychologists and social workers and environmental services and chaplains. It's left all of us in a position of acting more like scientists in a lab than pilgrims on a journey with the other. Indeed, humans are more than flesh and bones that need to be healed. But within the context of this current viral pandemic, the human person has often been separated from the disease that afflicts her or him. In turn, the focus within medical and spiritual care is often on the disease and not the person, creating a depersonalizing effect. Consequently, human beings are pushed toward objectification, being relegated to psychosomatic organisms, where the only thing that matters is their disease or their virus. We've reduced people, humans, who bear the image of God, to psychosomatic organisms where the only thing that matters is their disease or their virus. I think it was my patriarch, Kirill, who even said, we look at people now and we see them not as humans, but as sources of infection. That's a very powerful statement. We see them as sources of infection. All of this, though, places us squarely within the trajectory of the modern era and the modern approach. In reality, however, the goal of all medical care, not only in this postmodern generation, but from its very origin, is to help everyone involved to acknowledge and experience the sacred. For the very art of medicine itself, as the Hippocratic Oath says, The very art of medicine itself is to be, quote, guarded in holiness, unquote. Yes, in fact, a previous generation of medical clinicians might well have seen this as nonsensical. But there seems to be the possibility of renewed appreciation for this work 
From within the cadre, the newest physicians, nurses, PAs, techs, and all others involved in the care of sacred humanity. Humans are a mystery. Moreover, since this mysteriousness and incomprehensibility are part of our very being, we are not just flesh and blood, and we are not just the disease that affects us. Then this mysteriousness and this incomprehensibility, they ought to be factored significantly, significantly into the care given and received as well. Put simply, the care that we offer to people today, these days of great trial and tribulation, ought to remember first and foremost that the relationships that we are creating with our patients, regardless of our role, have, quote, within them the full potential of an ever-deepening relationship with the ultimate other, unquote. That is from Dan Hinshaw an Orthodox Christian and a retired surgeon here at the University of Michigan, that every encounter, every encounter, it's not about science always, every encounter has within it the potential of an ever-deepening relationship with the other. Healing may be found in trials and treatments, of course, but if that is our metric for success, then not every patient will end up being a victory and not every clinician will end up being a hero. However, in conclusion, when our focus is on the mystery of the person for whom we are caring, as much, if not more, than the symptoms with which they present themselves to us, then every encounter, whether it ends in life or in death, and sadly there has been lots of death, but every encounter, whether it ends in life or in death, has the possibility of being a success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Joshua. You're welcome. Thank you. So everyone keep questions in mind. We are, we're going to have Alex do his paper next, and then we'll have some time for hopefully um, some discussion at the end. Thank you so much. I'm going to unspotlight you, and then I'm going to spotlight Alex. Okay. Take it away, Alex. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, so thank you all for coming. Uh, because of the nature of Zoom, I can't see you, but hopefully uh, you'll feel seen through the nature of this uh, talk. Uh, the title of my piece is that the paranoia of a vaccinated body of Christ, an orthodox psychoanalytic approach to trauma-informed care of the other in the wake of vaccine hesitancy. So as a sort of introduction to my approach today, I am going to have three sections in which I kind of walk you through elements of this paper that I'm working through, but also of a set of conversations with a variety of different people that I'm, you know, sort of ongoing. And uh, once you uh, listen in, I'm sure we'll all understand that uh, whether it's 18 months in or 18 months from now, it will continue to be ongoing. Um, which also I'd like to thank Father Joshua for, for his piece. I think that was also incredible and already has informed mine. So um, the three sections to today's piece on the vaccinated body of Christ is uh, a sort of walk through the kind of cultural landscape of the world, this sort of dystopian nightmare that we all sort of live through every day. Uh, a short description of Lacanian psychoanalysis, specifically in Lacan's concept of RSI, or the real, the symbolic, and the imaginary, and how that sort of helps narrate the sort of problem and perhaps point us towards a uh, few productive solutions. And then thirdly, those productive solutions, ultimately the orthodox solution, and how orthodoxy kind of represents a new, uh, but yet in some same sense, old and consistent uh, vision of doing life that allows us to see and treat the sort of psychology of the coronavirus. So my thought is that the violent intrusion of the coronavirus onto the global public was really just as much of a psychological phenomenon as it was a physical event. Now, one could simply refer to the sort of seemingly infinite accounts of anxiety, you know, ones that talked about becoming a vector for viral transmission to loved ones, 
or the submission to public health authorities as evidenced by the signer of fire of the mask or the lack of submission uh, to public health authorities, for example, the lack of mask use or social distancing use or so on and so forth. A third might be like a sort of general sense of loneliness that was connected to the way in which communities were now moved to virtual ways of doing work, school, and specifically at the advent of coronavirus, church, uh, considering that it happened right before Pascha. And it all would be evidence to the legitimate range and scope of the psychological impact of the coronavirus. This is what I refer to as the psychology in coronavirus. You know, what is psychology in and among people? Uh, and I think that was described actually in really great detail in the earlier part of yesterday's plenary, uh, psychological uh, plenary speech, plenary, uh, by Dr. Clardy, you know, who described the way in which depression and anxiety and, you know, a variety of very material and diagnosable factors were on the rise from a variety of different reasons and factors. But what I'm speaking to today actually underscores this. Uh, it's the paranoia of a vaccinated body even more so the paranoia of a vaccinated body of Christ speaks to the psychology of coronavirus in today's day and age. So ultimately, if we were to only start and conclude with the previous understanding of psychology, we would forego an important understanding of how the virus affects the ego, how it affects our desires, and ultimately how it affects how one cares for the other through the unique rhetoric of vaccine hesitancy. So, in this context, in the sort of world in which we live, it can be very difficult to understand exactly how do we persuade people to either become vaccinated or even more so, how do we persuade people to feel safe and loved and cared for in a variety of different ways, regardless of where they come from. It can be very difficult considering, you know, tensions are high, we're all forced to live with one another, um, you know, and all of that creates sort of an impact magnifier that can be very difficult to navigate. My thought is that if we can understand how this affects us at the sort of most intimate of levels, we can begin to reorient and retool the way we do speech, which is to say, the better ways in which we can communicate with one another and better ways in which we can relate to one another. I think the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan is uniquely helpful in this way for a few different reasons. Um, I think Lacan provides a language for understanding or mapping the psychological phenomenon that is occurring, especially considering how one shores up their identity through language, through specific discourses. So uh, this might, you know, I think sound like sort of difficult. So I'll give a few examples for how Lacan's theory of the real, the symbolic, and the imaginary function whenever one of us communicates with one another. Firstly, Lacan's literal definitions of this is, you know, the idea of the real, which is where language breaks down for the subject. It is the sort of reality that can't be put into sheer words. There's the symbolic, which is literally the words, the language for how we structure our ability to relate to and through the world. And the third is the imaginary, the sense of value imported onto the symbolic. So Lacan describes the imaginary relationship between the signifier and signified. But you can think of that as like the mirror stage when a child imagines a relationship with its image in the mirror. The image is a symbol, but the belief that the reflection is me is imaginary. To use an orthodox example, let's think about uh, vestments. Uh, in a certain, in a sense, the imaginary, the symbolic is the robes. Literally, the act of putting on robes is a physical item. There is an imaginary value, which is the ritual significance. It literally takes on new spiritual metaphysical properties. And the real, the, that which cannot be described, uh, sort of separates us from truly being able to connect and understand is this one, the separation between, you know, us and our sort of conscious human experience and God, but also the sort of overwhelming, indescribable nature of God the Father that uh, sort of assumes the position of the priest when they do that, when they take on vestments. Now, so I say all of it to say that when Lacan describes something as imaginary and as I do, 
It's not to say that it's inherently false, but it is to say that there are connections and values that are unique and diagnosable that we should be engaging in. So in terms of uh, how RSI functions in the kind of way in which we think about vaccine hesitancy, we should think of vaccine hesitancy as speech. You know, when many of you as psychologists, therapists, counselors, psychoanalysts, when you, when a person in the clinic literally speaks their trauma, their grief, their frustration, their depression, their anxiety into the world, they are producing a symbolic world where you can then begin to navigate the ways in which those symbols uh, are structured through imaginary value, a way in which one is connected to the world, but also lead it back to the source of what truly is being spoken on here. True psychoanalysis's long history, uh, when we are communicating, we are often talking about ourselves. So with that in mind, let's kind of look at the speech proper. So the confrontation with COVID-19 in a sense, offers an imaginary. It offers an imagination of how one's biological mortality and civic mortality represented a certain way of life and norms and doing things that was ultimately described by this indescribable yet discernible, ultimately intrusive traumatic force, the sort of intrusive force of the coronavirus. We didn't really have a language to understand the coronavirus um, but we did know that it was this kind of real presence that kind of intruded into the public and forced us to reckon with it. Now, when I talk about biological mortality, I think uh, there's been a lot of really great speakers at this conference that talk about the reality of the coronavirus as literally having killed millions. I believe yesterday it might have been Father Ignatius Warren who said that uh, he opened a notification that said to date, five million people have been killed by the coronavirus worldwide. That's a physical reality that describes the sort of biological mortality that now we are forced to deal with the end of our lives, causing what he would then go on to talk about as death anxiety. Civic mortality is a bit different. We think of ourselves not just as human people with flesh and bones, but bones made of human rights, with flesh made out of the law, carved out of a sort of set, certain culture and a very American way of doing things. Now, of course, I'm speaking to a very American way of doing things, but also vaccine hesitant rhetoric does have a certain American tinge to it. And I will explain. Sort of to backpedal a bit, in the wake of this trauma, subjects across the world, but very much so in America, sought to naturalize this seemingly nature-defying virus with various discourses to sort of delegitimize the severity of the impact that faced them. These discourses were arbitrary. They were often contradictory and easily disproven, but they were centralized by an enduring refusal to succumb to socio-political, economic, and even religious forms of control that were honestly, most commonly depicted through science fiction versus science proper. Riddled with uncertainty and marked with disunity, these vaccine-hesitant subjects grounded their identity in the narratives that gave them hope. And those narratives depicted themselves as heroic, autonomous individuals in possession of hidden truth by defying a global uh sort of drive towards vaccination, even as vaccinated populations uh, unvaccinated populations such as them were both contracting and dying from the virus at record numbers. And to this day, considering the larger rates of vaccination, the larger amounts of contractions still belong almost exclusively, you know, and this obviously controls for uh, breakthrough cases. It almost exclusively still occurs in unvaccinated populations. So if they're not, they're not succumbing to the science of the situation, how can we better understand what they're saying? Ultimately, this is kind of what Lacan describes as the confrontation with the real. When one is forced to encounter the reality of their essentially incomplete humanity or lack, or in an orthodox state, you know, the sort of state of sin, um, we are, due to the failure of language, we respond by identifying with worldly solutions, new symbols, new ideas and strategies to mask the overwhelming terror of the real. Said differently, vaccine hesitancy can be understood as a speech birthed from trauma. It is birthed from the trauma of egoic individualism. 
And that makes sense if we think about how our culture is conditioned by individualist thinking so that we can become better hardened individuals, you know, sort of separate from community and separate from the other. And I say the other in terms of our literal neighbors, you know, uh, both literal and of course imaginary neighbors. So for any response to truly be persuasive, to, for us to truly have a strategy that allows us to speak to patients, to neighbors, to family and friends, as well as to our loved ones. And, you know, if we're Orthodox, also the ones we don't love, um, then we need a strategy that is trauma informed. You know, perhaps it's cliche, but cliches are a little bit true for them to become cliche. But people don't know that uh, they don't care about what you know until they know that you care. So my belief is that an orthodox psychoanalytic rhetorical criticism is two things. One, a mouthful. Two, it allows trauma-informed responses to understand that the increase in information bludgeoning people over the head with science and numbers and news and YouTube videos, ultimately, even that plus transparency will not break vaccine hesitancy. One thing that we've noticed about the coronavirus is that in an effort to fast track a vaccine, world uh, vaccination providers have made their information, their trials, increasingly transparent in a way that no medicine or global uh, corporation has ever really done before. And that was done and somewhat successfully to reduce vaccine hesitancy. But when you let people see how the sausage is made, some people don't want to eat sausage anymore. So there's kind of a good and bad that kind of came with it. Understanding that transparency and increase in information flows doesn't break vaccine hesitancy, but we need to understand why that's the case. And that's because trauma reorganizes logic around it's not, you know, K-N-O-T. Uh, so in order to untie that knot, we must be engaged at the level of their attachments, at the level of their desires, in order for them to begin to receive care from you. Uh, the beauty of psychoanalysis and the beauty of orthodoxy is the way in which one sort of repeats language that understands that the symbolic or that language itself might be arbitrary and instead continually goes to God in spite of that. In spite of our very human condition, Christ saves us. And because of that, we're able to use that as a sort of springboard for orthodox perspectives of trauma-informed care. So I provide three strategies in the way in which we can kind of approach this. I think ultimately that the Orthodox Church provides a communal approach to doing life that is somewhat unique. We obviously don't see this in certain traditions or denominations, but in Orthodoxy, historically, uh, there is not room for the ego. In order for their, a person to become Orthodox Christian, they have to remove, you know, the parts of, you know, they have to die onto the self every day. And this is what we understand through prayer. This is what we repeat those prayers. It is the constant dying unto self that forms us and reforms us into the body of Christ, which is other, otherwise understood as the church. That communal approach, at at least a philosophical level, provides justification for saying, I will take the vaccine as a way of loving my neighbor. Right, Because the vaccine becomes just another material and contemporary problem that truly was addressed thousands of years ago in Old and New Testament scripture. You know, And whether that's a, uh, a question of how we refer to the way in which Christians engage leprosy by being understanding there was real medical conditions that needed to be reached because the Christian is about affirming life in all instances, or... It's by the sort of ongoing church history that creates the sort of modern day hospital. Uh, the idea of a communal approach is the idea that there is not anything I can actually lose. It is a full deconstruction of what Father Ignatius yesterday talked about in terms of death anxiety. What is there to lose if you have only everything to gain in life with Christ? The second is by deferring to Orthodox leaders. If we are truly appealing to people based on their desires and their drives, it's likely uh, that we could convince them by appealing to the religious nature of their personhood. 
One such example is the very fact that scripture says that we should submit to authorities, specifically religious authorities as well. And major metropolitans of Orthodox churches have all come out in favor of uh, either the vaccination or of being mindful of conspiracy theories. A lot have said that we as the Orthodox believe in science, we're supportive of science. And here I'm referring to Metropolitan Tikhon of the Orthodox Church of America, Metropolitan Valerian of the Russian Orthodox Church, the Metropolitan jo uh, Joseph of the Antiochian Orthodox Church, Archdiocese. I had so many syllables, I forget which goes where. Um, but these metropolitans create a model by which we can sort of refer. If you see yourself as not only Christian, but Orthodox, then you probably need to understand the way in which we are a religion that ultimately is submitting to a higher power. Now, that's understood through the wisdom of our elders, right? So in that world, uh, there is the ability to have trauma-informed care because one can sort of sidestep trauma by truly caring towards one thing. It redirects their focus. The third is the where I'm going to spend the remainder of my time, which is that I thought we should also defer to Orthodox authorities that have engaged in trauma-informed care in the, in the community, like in the, uh, with the people. So Father Paul Abernathy of the Neighborhood Resilience Project and St. Moses the Black uh, Antiochian Orthodox Parish, once again with uh, syllables and mouthful, here in Pittsburgh provides an excellent example of a Orthodox authority that has received national media attention at being able to communicate with, persuade, and treat the vaccine hesitant. He's situated within Pittsburgh's Hill District, a historically Black community that has experienced legitimate racial trauma. So it's not through this sort of arbitrary egoic individualism that Black communities resist the virus. It's through public memory of things like Tuskegee and being experiment, experimented on as a people that makes them hesitant. But the cultivation of relationship, the willingness to be there, is what allows people like Father Paul to be truly and uniquely persuasive as a sort of church movement that's on the ground and that affects people. There's other examples. For example, in Toronto, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of Canada hosted a pop-up space to administer COVID vaccinations, representing a material and trauma-informed approach to the people that was willing to provide where worldly powers might have failed. Even yesterday, although I was unfortunately not able to see this, uh, I look forward to watching it on YouTube. In terms of how we begin to conceive of contemporary solutions, yesterday's treating trauma and being trauma-informed as an Orthodox Christian, I'll finish the sentence, by Dean Theophilus is an example that ultimately, if this conversation persuades you to do anything, it's that we need to push the parameters forward in terms of thinking about the ways in which the Orthodox Church has a historic and current investment in be in administering trauma-informed care. If we are there, then the people will see truly the body of Christ. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. Thank both of you. Um, wow, what, what a great talk. Okay, so what I would love is if folks want to turn on their videos, we could see each other and have some conversation, um, and feel free to unmute, unmute yourself as needed. You can type, sorry, this is my child. Um, <clears throat> you can, um, type in the chat if you'd like, um, or just, you know, pipe in with questions. Um, I'm, I'm super interested in sort of this interplay between like the communal and the individual, I guess, on the other hand, Ooh, bless, bless you. Um, so, Question when there's time. Herman Fields, why don't we start with you? I'll get to my question in a minute. Yeah. Sorry to butt in. Uh, thanks so much, Alex and uh, Father Joshua. It's really, really interesting listening to you guys. Um, I have a question for Alex, uh, because you talk about um, people who are, I like your, your gentle terminology, vaccine hesitant uh, because of trauma. And I'm, I'm actually Father Herman Fields. I'm a, a it's okay. Uh, pastor at uh, St. Vincent's in Saskatoon. And uh, so when I'm trying to pastor people who, because of traumatic, whether uh, imagined or otherwise, really, really, really don't want the vaccine, 
you talked about sort of convincing and what I, what I've had to sort of tell myself over and over is that is repeating the maxim by father Tom Hopko. Don't, don't ever try to convince anybody of anything because it seems like the act of trying to convince them uh, enhances the trauma because they feel, you know, attacked and maybe abandoned by the community. And, and so what I've been having to do is just do everything I can to not take a stance on, on anything, even though it sort of kills me uh, in a sense. So do, uh, when you're talking about caregivers and, and therapists and so forth who aren't priests, um, is there any sort of sense in which we deliberately perhaps don't try to convince at all? Um, yes, and thank you, Father. That's a great question. Um, I could be more specific. So I come from a rhetoric and communication background. So as part of that, although I might use terms like persuade or, uh, I mean, convince, um, that could probably be substituted with, you know, how are we, basically, how are we, you know, showing the good truth? How are we communicating the good truth in a way that is good? Um, So when I talk about trauma-informed care, the way in which that happens in the clinic, that I, for psychoanalytic, um, in psychoanalytic spaces, that I think is super mappable uh, from a pastoral position is the way in which one listens. You know, to be trauma-informed, one does not need to be silent, but they do need to be quiet. And by being quiet, you allow a person to speak. You ask questions. And instead of making sort of declarative statements like, well, you're wrong about this, or I don't know about that, or well, I really think you should do this. You know, those sort of prescriptive statements is exactly what you're describing. It's the thing that uh, traumatized and triggered individuals, you know, it's what makes them feel like you're biting the bullet. Like you, uh, you've been bought by the system that um, that is exactly trying to sort of indoctrinate you and me and et cetera and the world and you know, the mark of the beast is being chipped by Bill Gates and all of this. Um, But all of those thoughts, uh, you know, however uh, silly or serious they might be, comes from what Lacan describes as anxiety, which anxiety is fear that does not have an object. In that sense, it seems more silly. But fear is something that has an object. Underlying all anxieties are real fears. So by listening to them and allowing them to uh, you know, kind of communicate, asking those questions. Well, what are you afraid of? Do you think that God could not intercede here? Do you, you know, uh, like asking those questions, allowing them to kind of arrive at what is it that underscores everything is what I believe uh, allows for that true, you know, persuasion to occur. Because in a sense, we all act rhetorically and as Orthodox Christians in the sense that we all are attempting to persuade people that there is a vision of the good life that other people, you want other people to see it. But we're not persuading in a prescriptive sense. We are hoping to offer that in a sort of descriptive sense. This is what has happened in my life. So I think by doing that, by listening, you're able to really unearth the trauma, what trauma has like buried deep into the ground, you know, and if there's one thing that we as the Orthodox can rest on, it's that uh, certain things resurrect from the ground. So if we could, uh, if we can do that, then it puts us in a good direction. Thank you. I'm also willing to answer imaginary questions. There are many voices in my head. Uh, Michael Hubert wrote, so dot, 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 Rogers. As in Annie Rogers? As in, as in Carl. I think you're <laughs> <laughs> um, Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I'm very taken with this topic and with um, what both of you have said. Um, and I'll just say, because you were second, I'll talk about Alex first a minute. Um, you've given, you really have given me something to think about. I will say about viewing this vaccine hesitancy from the viewpoint of trauma. I, I had not really considered that. I live with someone who has refused to get vaccinated and 
has recently recovered from a moderate case of COVID and still after a month is not fully recovered, still has no taste or smell, um, et cetera, and find it extremely frustrating (laughs) um, that they just cannot be convinced. Um, You know, and we, we compare science and their science is right and my science is wrong. You know, we try to compare you know, um, facts and, you know, my facts are wrong. Their facts are right. Um, even down to more people are dying that are vaccinated than unvaccinated. It's really, it's, um, and sometimes we can decide to not talk about it. Okay. You do you, you know, um, but uh, I, anyway, I those I don't have a problem with clients. I let clients do that. I don't even I, sometimes I let I ask clients what are your fears, and I give them space to try to let them talk about their fears. But I never try to convince or persuade, as you said. Um, but I find it I confess really hard with those that I live with and uh you know i don't and i just don't understand i i just do not understand the block there you know so um that's all i'll say um about that um with regard to our first speaker i just really appreciated what he had to say about you know depersonalizing people with illness and especially in mental illness. You know, we see that so often that I am OCD. I am bipolar. I am whatever my diagnosis is. And it's so important to see the person and to help them see themselves that they are not their diagnosis. And a long time ago, a, a, a psychiatrist in a seminar said that I was attending taught that every spirit, every problem is a spiritual problem. And I try to remember that, um, that this person that's coming to me has more than just this thing. There is this spiritual aspect. And, um, and I think you are right that. The millennials are seeking that ancient mystery, that ancient wisdom, and to find that image of Christ within. I think about what you said, Father Joshua, about the deep personalization. And like, I, um, you know, I was in the hospital you know, the first week in April and, you know, everyone was dying of COVID and it was so crazy because there, and, and the second someone from dying, so the second someone died, they were whisked out and their bed was full again. Yeah. So yeah. like immediately there was literally no chance to even process like the guy in, you know, room 206 is like now a different guy and, and seeing, you know, seeing my, the nurses and, and physicians trying to care for these folks. I mean, they're, they're obviously like, it's protective, right? That you end up reducing it to just this person with a medical condition, because if you stop to consider what is in front of you, it's like literally completely overwhelming. Yeah. And it was just so, and so we worked really hard to kind of do all these initiatives with families to do social histories and to, to share, you know, personal information and get to know, because we were really the eyes and ears of the families, right? Yeah. Like, their family's going to go in. And so I think we, we worked hard to kind of do that, but at the same time, it became so painful. Like the more we did it, the more painful it became. So it was, yeah. we're still, <laughs> we're still working on that. Also, <sighs> uh, we, I, and by the way, like, I'm glad to connect with you on the chaplain side of things. Yeah. But, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I think about, like, I think just in terms of the vaccine hesitancy piece, what I've seen a lot recently is folks, you know, I, I, you know, families that come in or patients 
where, you know, they were, didn't want to get the vaccine for any number of reasons. And then, you know, someone they know got it and then like got very sick or maybe died. And then they decide, oh, actually, maybe I should get the vaccine, Mm -hmm. which, you know, it's just this like painfully individualistic, like the reason for not getting it was sort of very individualistic. And then ultimately their reason for actually deciding to get it, get to it, get it is still quite individualistic and very sort of, well, it didn't affect me till now. And then suddenly my cousin, you know, gets COVID and almost dies. And so I guess I'll consider it, which is just, it's so painful to us in the healthcare field to witness this mentality. And I think about like forgiveness vespers, uh, you know, you mentioned like being Orthodox, like we ask for forgiveness from the entire world. Like we ask for forgiveness from the whole, we don't see ourselves as only asking for forgiveness from this one guy that I said something mean to at church. I ask everyone for forgiveness. And also I try to love and care for everyone, even those that I don't particularly like. So that mentality is just like, it just, it, it's trying, it's calling us out of this, this individualistic way of thinking. Stop. Sorry. Um, Pokemon. <laughs> um, you know, and so anyways, just, those are my thoughts. I would love to hear what I'm going to think. Which, which Pokemon? Sorry, go on. Pokemon Go. He's using No, that's not what <laughs> no, I just said. No, nope. Hi, Sarah, son. I think you want to have a question. Uh, you're muted, you want to myself and okay hi um i just want to open the frame a little bit wider and just say that um not only vaccine hesitancy but the variety of responses that we have seen in people including many among our orthodox brothers and sisters and parishes and everyone i think for me has um brought closer this this impending apprehension of the incredible potential for division. And we know what that implies. Um, And so as this experience continues, and it will continue in different forms, um, I think we're all called to bear in some way the pain of more temporary or more extended separations, divisions, dissensions among our brothers. Um, What was the most painful for me when we entered this, this long journey with COVID was how, for how many people, what seemed obvious to me, whatever we do, we're bound by love and and concern for all the others. Um, This seems to have receded in the background someplace. So I guess I'm speaking to the, the carrying of this ongoing potential for division, conflict, splitting in all forms. Um, and how difficult that is and how I really feel like I want to connect and have support with, um, with people who perceive this on a certain level. So I appreciate very much Father Joshua's reminder about the mystery of every encounter and how we need to, and Alex's way of saying, we need to go much deeper because Almost everything we do, including my own, probably many of our own responses, are still contaminated by individualistic perspectives. That's it. Looks like we only have about four minutes left, but... Um, you want to ask another question? I don't want to take up every... Please, time. go for it. Yeah. Another, uh, maybe more of a comment for Alex, because I, I really found the trauma discussion so helpful. But from my pastoral experience, one of the main traumas or, or anxieties that I come up, uh, or people who come to me, are more from uh, members who are in the healthcare sector, like members of my parish. Uh, they already 
sometimes feel like a sort of a fringe minority in in a religious context because there can be a real anti-intellectual uh, uh, stream in, I think, in all religions, unfortunately. And, but they already sort of feel that way. But in, in the case of COVID, they're brought face to face with the fact that nobody really cares what they know. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have and how much uh, they like and admire you and how well they know you. At the end of the day, their voice really doesn't count very much with people who are vaccine hesitant, conspiracy theories and so forth. And and it's quite a trauma to find out that actually that that doesn't matter to the people who are my friends and, you know, claim to respect me and so forth. Um, and the trauma also of knowing like how to, well, that, that's a very, very traumatic thing for, for people as well. Um, and how to pastor people and be willing to challenge them when it's completely destroying their relationship with the church and with their fellow members, even if I happen to think that their position is a lot better informed. Um, so that's an, that's the other side of the sort of traumatic conflict that I've come face to face with, which I understand you couldn't, it wasn't really a part of your presentation. Uh, no, and if, if I can respond very briefly, um, my, my whole hope with my religious psychoanalytic theories, um, and especially as I continue as an academic, is to broaden the way in which we think about trauma. If trauma represents an initial separation, what sort of primordial separation best animates every other separation than sin? That's not to say that every disagreement is because one person is the sinner, but the way in which those conflicts escalate certainly is. And, you know, this presentation was born in ways uh, in in the reflections of me going to war with family members uh, and bludgeoning them with information and stats and being ultimately unsuccessful. Um, you know, I, I deeply and intimately hear what you're saying. And I think a lot of our discussion about individualism, when we feel that, when we see it in our sort of Christian brethren, um, we should resist it. You know, the individual mindset that says, I will act based off of what benefits me sort of exclusively, and not what really benefits us collectively. I think that's what we need to be teaching in our churches and the converse, it should underscore the conversations we have with our friends. And, you know, uh, it's nice to be recognized as a PhD student. That means nothing to my family and friends. Uh, so I, I get that as well. Um, but, you know, it's it's the struggle, uh, the slow and gentle struggle that understanding that people's trauma of being born in an individualist country, uh, we have to have grace um, with the fact that, you know, people are like, oh, it's such a privilege to have been born in America during this time in the world. And the only truth to that is that we were born in a time where like both the Lord of the Rings was written and it turned into movies. Like, that's great. Like, you know, outside of that, I'm unsure and unconvinced that there's anything unique about this time period. Uh, Don't forget the Packers, the Green Bay Packers. This is where one has to persuade and be debated, right? You know, so uh, yeah, I would just say that, um, the, the great struggle that we do not think about often in our contemporary world, in our postmodern world, is that we live in a world that struggles with the sin of the ego, the sin of individualism. So when we begin to realize that and that it's an assumed norm for children to elders, you know, it's hard to have grace with that. But it, the good book says we kind of have to. So that's sort of... My hope. My hope is uh, a prayer for strength for, for your struggle and for the many struggles that I think Suzanne as well um, and a few, a few other people that have uh, communicated that today. So God be with you. Thank you all for this great discussion. Um, I'm aware of the time and in 15 minutes we start our annual membership meeting and lunch. Um, so anyways, just want to thank Alex and Father Joshua and all of you for being present with us and um, we will see you at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. so much. Such a great constructive and informative conference. Thanks, Tanya. Great to see you.